Today we continue on with this idea of answering the question, what is it that Jesus wants from me? Uh, And we have already looked at a couple of things that Jesus wants from us. Now remember the context of his teaching, Jesus and the remaining 11 disciples are making their way through the vineyards of Galilee on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. As they walk along, Jesus teaches them these important truths, the things that he wants to see in their lives. He's going to leave them soon and they are going to have an important work to do. They're going to have to establish his church, but they will not be able to do that work unless they fulfill these things that he's telling them. Uh, And so he tells them that they need to be attached to the vine, that he is the vine and they are the branches. They need to be attached to him if they're going to be able to bear fruit or grow or build a church. Uh, So really what that boils down to is that they need to put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. And he makes a promise that if they do that, he will give them the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper. And the Holy Spirit will enable them to teach other people the things that they themselves have been taught. The Holy Spirit will enable them to bring back to their memories those things they have heard over the last three years. And not only that, but to understand them. Last week we looked at how Jesus commanded them to be a people of prayer. Uh, We thought about prayer and how prayer isn't an optional extra, an add-on to the Christian life. You can't be a Christian and not pray. If you are a Christian, if you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are commanded to pray. And if you pray... And pray in accordance with the way you're taught in God's word. Then we are given a promise that whatever we ask will be done for us. Great promise, isn't it? Now today, this is the third in this series. And again, Jesus gives another command. Well, perhaps he repeats a command that he previously gave in the upper room. And that command, and that's my first point, love is commanded. Love one another. Jesus commands us to love one another. Why do you think Jesus felt that he had to command us to love one another? After all, aren't we... A new creation, we are born again believers. And as born again believers, we begin to take on the fruits of the Spirit. And we thought about those last time. What is the most important of all the fruits of the Spirit? The most important of all the fruits of the Spirit, as Paul puts it, he listed the fruits. And he says at the end of it, the greatest of these is love. The most important of all the fruits of the Spirit that we can possess is love. So why, if love is a fruit of the Spirit, does Jesus feel it necessary to command us to love? Well, because even though we're born again, even though we're new creations, even though we have a new heart, new desires, we still have much of the old nature still there. And the old nature is at war with our new nature. And so there are things that we must know that we cannot leave out. There are things that we really must do in our new nature. And one of them is love. Now to understand the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do things. But we still must 
do the things. We have to make the effort. Take an action to do it. We're not machines. On the day that we're born again, there isn't a flick, a switch that is flicked and all of a sudden we do all these great and good things. We have to learn to do them. We enter into a process we call sanctification. And in that process we take on more and more of the good and get rid of more and more of the bad. And so the further you are along in the Christian life, then the more mature you are as a believer and the more of the fruits of the Spirit should be evident in your life. God doesn't overrule in our nature. He gives us a new desire, but the old desires are still there. So we have to constantly be making choices. And God is pleased with us when we make the right choices. And Jesus wants us to know that one of the choices we should be making is to love one another. So what does it mean to love one another? When we think of love, we think of an emotion, something we feel like a, a warm feeling towards someone else, sort of feeling that makes you feel good, makes you happy inside. But I don't think that adequately conveys the kind of love that Jesus is commanding here. Well, there certainly is affection involved. Paul expresses it when he writes to the Ephesian church in chapter 4, verse 32. He says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. That word tender hearted, well, it's talking of affection, the feeling of the heart. So affection is involved. There is to be tenderness in our feelings towards one another, a kindness in our words, a warmth in our treatment of each other. A delight in being able to minister to others' needs. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see a greater exhibition of that kind of affection throughout the church? It can be soul destroying to see the opposite in congregations. Christians accusing each other of all sorts of things. Jumping down one another's throats. Speaking roughly, cutting and criticizing one another. Very often that happens. There's an old adage that says you will catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. And that's so true. And the honey in our relationships should be love. But love in the biblical sense is more an action than a feeling. And there is a special Greek word for Christian love, and we have talked about it before. It's the word agape. And agape is a word that is used to describe Christ's love for us, a sacrificial love. The Greeks had several different words for love. Eros, you're familiar with. The passionate love between a couple. Philos, family love, the love of family bonds. But agape is different. Agape should be thought of as an unselfish action toward others, sacrificially giving to others what they need without regard for personal loss or gain. And there are examples of it in the Bible. 
And one that immediately comes to my mind is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a good illustration of the kind of love that Christ wants us to practice. When the Samaritan saw that injured man lying along the side of the road, he, what did he do? He got off his donkey and he helped. He didn't get up a petition complaining about the man's treatment by his fellow men. Nor did he take time to think about what it was going to cost him and how much helping this man would infringe upon his plans. He just sees a man in need and he selflessly responds to the need. Did it cost him anything? Yes, of course it did. It cost him time and effort. It cost him money. But it was well worth it as far as the Samaritan was concerned because it gave him the joy of knowing that he had helped someone in need. And at the end of that parable, what does Jesus say? He says, go and do the same or go and do likewise. And so that's what we're to do. We're to Love in that sort of way. Another thought came to me here when I was thinking about this showing of love. When was the last time you told those nearest to you that you loved them? A profession of love can be such an encouraging thing in a relationship. You're not like the old farmer who it was coming to a particular wedding anniversary and in a conversation with a neighbor, the neighbor says to him, do you tell your wife that you love her? He says, I told her once the day we were married. Sure, that should be enough. It's not enough. We should be prepared to tell people that we love them. And that simple declaration of love can be such an encouragement. They're important to us. Don't ever presume that your partner, or your friend, or those dearest to you know that you love them. Tell them you do. We often have difficulty with this, of course. Fearing that it might be misunderstood. What's he looking for? <laughs> Yet, such warmth of words helps us to deal with the hard things in life. The security of knowing that you are loved by others and loved on conditionally. It helps you deal with so many difficult things. The Apostle Paul wasn't a bit afraid to show the people in Corinth that he still loved them. Even though they were a hard people to love. As he writes his letter to them, he is dealing with the people who have been against him at times. They denied his apostleship. They sought to contradict his teaching. They questioned his sincerity. And you know, if that happened to me, I, I'm not sure how I would respond. But the Apostle Paul kept on confessing his love for them. And showing his love for them by his prayers, by his wise counsel, by his good wishes, his gracious teaching, and so on. And so when he writes to them, one of the greatest letters about love that we have was written to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 13, often used in a wedding. 
It's easy to love people who love you back. Those whom you know will reciprocate. But how about those people who are a wee bit difficult to love? Where does love one another fit in with that? How far does it demand that we go in loving others? Well, when John writes his first letter to the New Testament church, in chapter 3, verse 14, he says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren, or we love one another. He who does not love abides in death. So, again, what is being stressed here is that love is not an option. It's easy to say, oh, I love the folks in Taliban. But are you sincere? Remember that you're including everybody, not just that special group of friends that you're particularly friendly with. The challenge that each of us face today in regard to this text is clear. We must love one another, individually, warts and all. And let's be honest, some people are harder to love than others. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, we must not single out the easy to love and avoid the harder to love. Christ is calling us to love one another. And we shouldn't be content with a love that just caters for our bodies. Our love must stretch its boundaries to be truly loving one another. Jesus did not just tell us to love when we get around to it. He didn't say to love if someone loves you first. We are to pursue opportunities to love one another. We are to look around us and see people's needs and respond to them in love. So love is commanded. Secondly, love needs to be clarified. Love needs to be clarified. To be told to love is one thing, but to understand what this love is, is another The disciples wouldn't have argued that they needed to love one another. And I'm sure neither would you. What's the alternative anyway? Well, the opposite of love is hate. Hate one another. And I'm sure no one here holds hatred for anyone else. So we would agree with this. But how does this love thing work out? Well, Jesus makes it clear. We are to love one another just as I have loved you. Now, if we're looking for a guideline for love, here it is. Christian love, the sort of love that Jesus is commanding us to have, is to be Love that exemplifies Christ's love for us. Cast her mind back to that time when Peter was trying to be spiritual and thinking that when somebody offends him, he is to forgive them up to seven times. But Jesus rebuked him, remember. And he particularly rebukes Peter's concept of forgiveness. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. And that is love without limit, folks. 
That's loving as Christ loved. He forgave us without limit. He puts no limits on his love for us. Look at the ministry of Christ. I'm sure there were times when he just was frustrated. The crowds of people pressing in upon him. Reaching out to touch him so that they could receive something from him. Maybe healing. Deliverance from some pain or physical infirmity or or mental condition. Day after day, Jesus would toil among those people. Most of them were not serious about following him. They just wanted something from him. But taking up the cross uh, wasn't part of it. But yet, Jesus ministered to them. Regardless. He demonstrated his love for them openly, without limit. And so if you want to love as Jesus loved, then you actively meet the needs of those who may not do anything for you in return. Christ loved his disciples. But they weren't always easy to love. Peter, brash, impetuous, slow to learn, even denying he knew Jesus. James and John were full of arrogance. Thomas was a skeptic. Judas was a betrayer. But yet Jesus patiently loved them took time with them even when they they struggled to grasp what he was teaching them he was full of compassion for them he protected them and forgave them and, and here in these last days his love for them is particularly shown by his desire to keep them from being troubled in their hearts We are to love following his example. But how far should we go in showing Christian love? Well, verse 13 tells us, Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. Christian love does not have a stopping point. It goes to the extent of giving yourself. That is not what the word teaches. We live in a selfish world. A world where everyone is out for themselves. I used to get frustrated with the attitude that was taught in school. And I'm sure it's no different now than when my girls were being taught. Stand up for yourself. Think of yourself. Christ never, ever taught that. Love one another. And he fully demonstrated it by the fact that he laid down his life for us. And he did it willingly. He wasn't forced into it. It wasn't some dreadful accident, some victory of the devil. It was a willing submission to the plan of his father. Because he loves us. And such sacrificial love is what we are to have as well. We should be willing to be inconvenienced in order to love others. Love won't always fit into your nice tidy schedule. 
Sometimes you'll have to go outside of your comfort zone to love. Maybe loving someone means that you're going to have to miss out on some personal indulgence, some thing that you were looking forward to. Because you see, love is costly. We need to decide that people mean more to us than whatever cost it takes to love them. What would you do if you were called upon to lay down your life for someone else? Or maybe less extreme, to suffer some hardship for someone else. I read recently a story about the kind of sacrificial love that Christ is talking about here. And it's a, a true incident that happened during the uh, Crimean War. Uh, the North Koreans sunk an American naval vessel. There were 82 crew taken hostage. 13 of those 82 crew members were thrown into a brutal captivity. They were required to sit in a rigid manner around a table for hours, not moving. After every few hours, the door would have been violently flung open and a guard came in and brutally beat the first man in the first chair with the butt of his rifle. The next day, as they sat in their assigned places, again the door was thrown open and the man in the first chair was brutally beaten again. On the third day, it happened again to the same man in the same chair. Now knowing that that man could not survive another beating, one young sailor took his place. And when the door was flung open, the guard didn't look to see who was sitting in the chair, but he beat the victim senseless. And so for the pursuing weeks, each day, a different man took the chair and took the beating. Until the guards, in exasperation, give up. And left them alone. They were unable to beat. That kind of sacrificial love. And that. Is the kind of love. That defeats the devil folks. If we love one another. Like that. Thirdly and very briefly. The relationship of love. Because this command to love is, is brought into full circle here with the relationship that it has to obedience. Jesus says in verses 14 and 17, You are my friends if you do what I command you. And what is it that he commands us to do? To love one another. Our obedience to Christ forces us to love one another. Now, sometimes an unbeliever can be inspired to show great love to his fellow man. And there are countless examples of that kind of love. We call it philanthropy. The doing of some special act of kindness or goodness to people less fortunate than yourself. But what Christ calls for in terms of love can be distinguished from that. A philanthropist may be an outright pagan. 
but yet is stirred to show some generosity toward others. But true Christian love is wrapped in devoted obedience to Jesus Christ. It is not love or obedience that is demanded. Instead, it is love because of obedience. We love because we want to obey the commands of Christ. And you know, if we try to love outside of that obedience to Christ then our love will have loopholes. Your love will not satisfy. Your love will not stand before the judgment bar of God. An obedient life gives you a foundation for proper Christian love. It keeps your love from being an extension of self-interest. It purifies your love so that it is not hypocritical or deceitful. And remember, this call to Christian love is within the context of living or abiding in Christ as his disciple. When we are attached to the vine, when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are given the enabling power of the Holy Spirit we are commanded to pray and when we pray we are promised that if we pray in accordance with God's word our prayers will be answered. And now we're commanded to love. And if we love in obedience to Christ and love following his example of sacrificial love then amazing things will happen within the church of Jesus Christ. This is what he wants to see in us. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian believers, and this is what he said, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. And that is my prayer for you today, that the Lord will cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the teaching that you have given us again today, this command to love one another. And we are thankful, Lord, that in this congregation there is a very evident love for one another. But Lord, we know we are not perfect. We know that each of us have areas of our lives that need to be improved. And so we do pray that you would cause us to increase and abound even more in love for one another. That Lord, the world may look at us and say, see how they love one another. Amen.